Okay. Um, so uh, I'll talk about other matters if time permits. There you go. Uh, all right, so uh, I'll start off and just sort of give you an idea of where I'm coming from, what problems I care about right now. Um, I'm going to talk about the BFO 2020 axiomatization. I don't know what uh, people, I know pe some people understand what it is and, and you know it in, in some detail and other, people's might not, other people might not, so I'll, I'll go into how that came about and what it is. Um, from there, I'll talk about the temp current temporalized alt time and some time relation and why they uh, were necessary. Um, and then I'll go into some alternatives for temporalizing relations um, that hopefully might uh, offer uh, useful patterns uh, for the future. Um, and then if there's time, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of proposals uh, more generally about what BFO uh, needs. So um, I use ontology for stuff. Um, the ontologies mean I always work with data. Uh, instance data. So uh, that may be different than uh, some uses. Um, and uh, I, I need to use the ontology. I, need, I structure, I query, um, uh, I use it to make it understandable. And uh, time matters. I need to express and query when something happens, right? Um, I care about the past and future even if somebody else thinks they, they don't. Um, my tools are OWL, RDF, and, and Sparkle. Uh, I think generally to make use of the technologies we have now, we have to use multiple tools and, and, and go beyond this. Um, I generally want to make them do as much work for me as they can, which is why I, I, I focus on doing, um, adding axioms to my ontologies rather than having simple class trees. Uh, it wasn't my choice that BFO had no, uh, nothing other than, uh, than classes and subclass relations. Um, but, you know, Al doesn't make it easy to work with uh, stuff, and, and Werner is blissfully um, uh, spared that, but the rest of us have to work with Al, and so um, all, almost all of the issues that are going to come up really come up because we're working with Al and we need to work with binary relations. Um, so why do I use BFO? Well, it provides a basic theory of the world. Um, I think it helps a lot with just structuring our thinking, uh, just by observation. Um, it helps people get into the same groove uh, when you try to at least um, align to a top-level class. And in theory, BFO should make uh, ontologies more interoperable. Um, I'm, I'm of mixed opinion uh, as to how successful that's, that's been. Um, but, you know, working with BFO isn't, isn't easy. Um, and in particular, um, it's hard sometimes to sort of communicate with people who are doing it, but even among the developers, there are parts of, of BFO that we don't agree about or we give different answers to. And so, um, you know, the, the question is why does this happen, and in particular, how do we manage it? And uh, right now, or b before the axiomatization, right, we'd go to the reference manual. But the reference manual is really underspecifies BFO. It gives you some hints. Um, the formulas inside of it are, are um, uh, aspirational, let's say, uh, but not checked. Um, when, when we can't get an answer there, you know, we argue about it and usually don't come to a resolution. Uh, and then when all else fails, we ask Barry. And of course, that's unsustainable, even if we start asking John. Um, so. Uh, the axiomatization basically comes out of a, a desire to make that less so, to have something that's more of a solid background reference that we can, um, where we can, uh, you know, answer questions. So what are the general problems with BFO? Well, so some of them are uh, that it's not sufficient in certain areas, uh, fields and rates. Um, if I have time, I'll talk about rates a bit at least. Um, there are areas where BFO isn't clear uh, what kind of process parts there are, and so um, uh, that isn't axiomatized particularly well uh, when I try to match it up with some of the uses like pro process profiles. There's disagreements over correct use. I'm hoping that uh, the, the axiomatizer can help that. Um, and then, of course, there's the difficulties with tools. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. Now I, oh, I see. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, so um, uh, if these are the, the sort of four areas, then um, 
Then one and two will be um, uh, addressed with new ish ideas, hopefully. Um, three will be helped with um, better formalization, and that's the work, main work that I, I did. Um, and then four can be ameliorated by developing different representation patterns, and I'm going to show some different patterns uh, for representing time. So coming into the, you know, when I built the axiomatization, um, the two things that, you know, sort of bothered me were the reference uses first order logic and that wasn't, wasn't checked. And my experience is it's really hard to write logic flawlessly. That's easy, too easy to make a mistake. And it, it says nothing at all about BFOL, right? Um, and I observed these, these glaring differences between BFOL, um, uh, particularly in the continuant relations, and felt there need to, needed to be some sort of reconciliation. The BFOL, uh, if we say we're using BFO, we ought to be using BFO. And, and how do we tell uh, whether we are? Um, the axiomatization is a, is, it's a first draft. It's, in some sense, kind of amateur work compared to you know, somebody like Fabian. Um, it's really an invitation to people to um, improve it, uh, to extend it. It's a, a starting place. Um, and that's sort of how I hope it'll evolve in the future. Um, it's known to be incomplete, and I can name some areas if people want to talk about that. Uh, what is it? Um, so it, it, it's a very set of things that um, describe it. Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous today. Um, so it's a set of axioms, and I'll show you what they look like. Um, in, uh, in a deliberately limited first order logic, um, I tried to make things um, really simple. And also, I'm engineering uh, this stuff. I'm using tools. And so I wanted to limit the expressivity. Um, it's my understanding of BFO theory um, in coordination with Barry. Um, and uh, that may not be everybody's understanding. That the, the hope is, again, that people will be looking at it and, and finding parts that they disagree with. Um, there are some changes relative to the reference. Um, I won't talk about those right now. Uh, importantly, there's a proof that it's consistent, um, a model. Um, it's part of a standard. Um, it's a tool for leveraging, uh, you know, answering questions the way Werner is. Um, importantly, it's going to be a basis for how we decide that a BFO version is, BFO, BFO -L version is a, a version of BFO. And it's a software artifact. I, I've thought of this as um, in the same way that I think of developing software. It's under version control. It's got tests uh, and the like. So um, people may have seen much of it. Um, this is what it looks like for someone who doesn't know what an axiomatization is. There's a bunch of um, uh, axioms, about 350 more, that look like these. Um, that's another format. That's the cliff format of them. Um, I, I may use the cliff format in some of the some of the examples, and then the second part of it uh, is the model. The model is kind of a hypothetical world, a world that I built up, and making a bunch of statements. Um, and the idea is that if the theory, if all the formulas in the theory on this model come out uh, true, then the model is consistent. Um, and this is a um, a really important thing because uh, if you have an inconsistent set of logical formulas, you can prove anything false or true, right? So uh, if you don't start off with a consistent theory and you don't know it's consistent, you can't trust what the answers are. Okay. Uh, so how has it been applied? Well, we've seen a couple of cases. Uh, Werner, uh, I understand the Industrial Ontology Foundry is building uh, some BFO-based ontologies using the axiomatization directly. Um, I used it to, um, in part, build BFO OWL, and BFO 2020 OWL, and to verify it. Um, others using it, please talk to me afterwards. I'm just curious. And uh, contributions are welcome. There's an issue tracker. Okay, so, OWL. Uh, I think we've kind of answered this question, right? Uh, OWL is decidable. Um, it's guaranteed to finish. It may not finish quickly, uh, but generally it does. Uh, full isn't. What happens typically is this timeout thing. Um, you, you, uh, even fr fundamentally, you don't know if you ask a question of a theorem prover whether it will actually terminate or go into an infinite loop. You can't tell. So we always have to limit it. Um, time. The reasoners for OWL are, are effective. Uh, we can do queries against OWLs. Queries against uh, full theory are harder because you have to sort of 
Uh, well, you have to ask a lot of questions to answer one question. Uh, but it can be used to good effect, and I'm hoping to see that it'll be used um, in other contexts. I love, um, I love uh, Fabian's approach. I think that's great. All right, so what does it mean to verify BFOL? Uh, so we're transforming, as, as Fabian said, we've, we transform um, you know, something in Manchester Functional Turtle into a formula that looks like this. And uh, I use RDF type. I could have used class expression or instance of. Um, so when we translate it, if we're going to prove something from the theory, then every, every predicate, and like here in RDF type and, and P, um, every predicate has to be in the theory. If the theory doesn't know a predicate, it can't prove anything about it, right? Um, so uh, here's, the, here's the problem. We've talked about it already, right? Um, we have three place relations. Um, and um, sorry, I'm just just give you some examples, right? Um, time always matters in my view, all right? So uh, when somebody says that time doesn't matter, I'm usually quite skeptical. Um, nomenclature, third argument being uh, time is called temporal indexing, and uh, it's a, a relationship is called ternary when there are three arguments. So not all of the relationships in BFO are ternary. Um, if you have a role, then you have it for as long as you exist. So we don't say that you inhere in at some time because you can figure out uh, when the role exists and it only inheres in for that whole time that it exists. And that's true for specific dependence. And most of the relations involving occur occurrence are binary. Oh, the, I'm sorry, Alan. Yes. I'm trying to listen to you and I'm trying to read the slides and I don't make it through the slides. Okay. Do you, do you mind? I will pause and let people read the slides. Um, all right, so yeah, not all relations are ternary, so uh, some of the translation, the part, uh, the no time part that, that Fabian used um, is, is an easy translation relatively, um, but not completely. Um, and most relations involving occurrence are binary. Uh, you want to give a tip of the hat? That way, I'll, okay. Uh, and as we know, uh, OWL only has binary relations. Um, so, we have to translate them in some way, uh, and the question is, right, these, these just don't make sense right now. RDF type is not in theory, there's no time index, so we're going to have to figure out what to do. And that was true for most of the continuant relations in BFO. So RDF type is suggestive, right? It looks like something like instance of, but it isn't. Part of an OWL uh, in, in, in the relation ontology version of part of and, and early versions of, of OWL um, look like part of in BFO. They have the same name, but they're different, right? They have two indices versus three indices. So these things have no counterpart in BFO, and we're going to have to give them an interpretation in order to be able to understand them, you know, to be able to do anything manipulative, mani ma manipulate with them. So what do we do? Well. Um, First option is punt. Uh, just have, just ignore all the three-place relations, and that's in the no-time version of, of BFO OWL. Um, it's not particularly satisfying. Um, the other way is to try to figure out some way that all of the relations in BFO can be leveraged, at least in some way, right? And that's really the target I was aiming for. Some way of using them is better than no way. So. The first part of, of doing this was the uh, issue of part of um, being used for occurrence and continuance. And in the continuant case, it's time indexed. And in the occurrent case, it's not. And so the first split is to create two relations, um, continuant part of and occurrent part of. OK, just a second. So the idea is to create relations that are, um, in terms of the relations we do have, 
um, that are somehow uh, useful. And the method was that I used was inspired by the re paper Relations in Biomedical Ontology. And that in that paper, um, class-class relationships, which is what was being used by um, OBO at the time, are explained or, or defined in terms of instance relations. And we think that um, you know in BioFO everything boils down to the instances. So we don't know what we're saying when we say uh, relate a class to a class, unless we say subclasses or a few things. So we had to define those. And the trick was uh, that um, uh, that we defined uh, a, uh, this class one has cla part two class two as this formula here, right? Um, we basically um, we don't have t in it because we're quantifying over t here. Uh, the t I call that absorbing. The time is absorbed into the relationship. And people were happy enough by this, um, f uh, with this until uh, relations by a medical ontology came around, and, and to some extent until I came around uh, advocating we use OWL. Uh, and OWL does not have class-class relations. OWL has uh, only instance-based relations, uh, notwithstanding uh, that you can say uh, class is a subclass. The classes are not in the domain of discourse. They're, they're, they're constraints on what the models can be. So um, how can I absorb time? So I created two versions. Uh, and these are basically you know, the only ones I could think of, right? So one, I said, you know, at some time it holds. And the other, uh, at all times it holds. Um, but we still have to say what we meant by all times. We don't mean it holds forever, right? So there's some way that we have to guard uh, the time. And so uh, the time is guarded, so to speak, by uh, the term of existence. So. Um, as long as, sorry, this is the part of it all times. Let me just read this again. Right, for all, this is the important part. For all t, uh, if p exists, that's the subject at t, uh, then the relationship holds, right? Um, and then uh, for the sometime relations, uh, we just have to say there's some time when the relationship holds. And of course, both things have to exist. So I applied this pattern, uh, and that's why we have um, the all-time relations, the all-time and sometime relations, which are not very popular. Um, there's another problem that came up with this, which is that uh, the relations don't have natural inverses, meaning that you know usually we think of uh, has part and part of as being um, defined with the same pattern and being inverses of each other. Uh, but when you do this translation, they're not. And the reason boils down to the quantification down here that P uh, and Q are, are different. In one case, uh, the, we're quantifying on the existence of the subject. When we do an inverse, the subject is now the object. And so we would have to quantify on the existence of the object. And that's not the same formula. So we have extra relationships which are inverses of these. And this shouldn't be surprising uh, if we're coming from the background of OBO. Um, in the class relations, has part and part of, we're not inverses. All right. Um, what are the criticisms? Uh, I think some of them are quite legitimate. Um, they're not exactly the same pattern as in the relations in biomedical ontology pattern. Uh, in that case, uh, the temporal extent was determined by the instantiation of a class rather than the whole existence of an entity. Um, relations were, some relations were defined as permanent and generic. The example being, you know, a nucleus is always part of a cell, some cell, but it can be different cells at different times. Um, OWL doesn't have that. You can only relate to one thing. Uh, at one, there's no time. Um, another criticism is that there's too many relationships uh, and this you know, causes a burden for the users and I think it does. I think that's potentially alleviated by, by a tooling improvement but that tooling improvement hasn't happened. Um, most interestingly um, it exposed issues with representing non-rigid classes in OWL and I'll talk about that soon. And these are sort of fundamental, um, not specific to the temporalized relations, but uh, the, uh, having the temporalized relations proposed is what triggered um, this realization and the um, distress over it. And then there's the legacy um, 
issue. There were a lot of ontologies that used these binary relations. Boy, it's a lot of work to change them. We're just not going to do that. It's too much work. Um, and then finally, nobody likes them. I don't like them. Okay, they're not fun. Um, so, all right. Let me talk about rigid and non-rigid classes. So a rigid class is a class uh, where instances, if they're an instance of the class at one time, are instances of the class at all time. Um, I'm a person, I always would be a person, I can't become a cat. Uh, Non-rigid classes are, are things that are, let's say, defined by a rule. I can be a student now and not a student later. The, the, um, the OWL version, the BFO 2020 OWL, only has rigid classes. Most classes in BFO are rigid. The only exception are the subclasses of material entity. Um, and that was, uh, those were originally disjoint with each other and then they would have been rigid. Now they're uh, interchangeable and for reasons I can answer if somebody's particularly interested. So the question really is, how do we, um, how do we translate RDF type, right? Because that was the second piece of it. I've already said how I might translate part of. And so the translation for RDF type um, was this. I used it again. It basically, it says that if you're of this type, you, uh, at any time you exist, you're still an instance of that type. That's what the RDF type is interpreted at. And it's in the, it, this makes me uncomfortable uh, because I think it can't be used in some cases, and I'll show you. It doesn't work in that form. Um, and this is sort of going to be sort of an open question. Uh, you can't say, you can't use this and say um, somebody is uh, uh, a lawyer because they're not a lawyer at all time, they, they exist, right? So if you translated RDF type this way, you'd be saying uh, false things. Uh, did it switch? All right, so the common example is um, lawyer. Uh, is this out of order? Hang on a second. Ah, sorry, I missed the class. I missed the slide. All right, so in many cases, our RDF type, uh, type interpretation works. Um, the common pattern for uh, which we all were sort of taught um, early on was that um, you could define something like a lawyer as a person that bears some lawyer role. Sounds good. What's wrong with the picture? Uh, well, uh, lawyers are only lawyers some part of their life. They aren't lawyers before they're licensed, and they're not lawyers after they've been disbarred. Um, so what do we translate um, RDF type to when we have this situation, right? It can't be the original one. And the answer is, I don't know yet, OK? Um, and one idea is that, you know, don't do that. <laughs> and, and, and you can avoid doing that if you want. Uh, I think I'll have a slide in a moment. Right. We don't have to say John instantiates the lawyer. We can say John has um, uh, the lawyer role and that the role exists at. Um, the limitations uh, um, uh, of OWL become more uh, clear if you ask, how would you define former lawyer in OWL? Well, there's no way. There's no way to say when that lawyer was, right? Um, what, what do you do about a data set that has some lawyers that are disbarred and you have to know uh, when they are? So um, really, I think this class that we've defined boils down to, sorry again with the sometime, it's a lawyer at some time, right? That's the only interpretation I can think of it. And usually that's not what we mean. And the fact that we query and get what seem to be correct answers seems rather lucky to me and circumstantial. Um, here's how you would properly query for when, you know, a lawyer um, at a certain time. Uh, you'd basically say um, there's a, lot, a, a person, a role, a temporal interval. The role exists at the temporal interval, and then you can add concrete times um, describing the interval. And there's a Sparkle query that asks, you know, uh, uh, find me lawyers in 1970. Um, I think find me lawyers set alone doesn't make sense uh, unless you have, uh, you know, unless you think only now matters. Uh, but now it keeps moving. So we're ontologists, we build now and later. And, you know, so now is not a very good anchor. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, I had a bit of a scare um, last week as I was preparing for this talk, uh, realizing that I was using this interpretation of RDF type and I needed to make sure that I didn't use it too deeply in the axiomatization because it's not always true. So I double checked. It's only used um, in cases of non-rigid classes. Um, so that's good. And it leaves open the question of what the interpretation would be for, uh, it's, sorry, it's only used for rigid classes. It leaves open the interpretation of what, what it should mean for um, other classes. Uh, and maybe it should be, um, it means instance of at some type, uh, at some time. Uh, I'm not sure. I haven't worked this through, but uh, this is something that I'd like to hear about from people. And, and the reason that uh, that works, um, instance of it some type, is because at least it, it's not false for the lawyer case, right? If you say that you're RDF uh, lawyer, uh, Alan RDF type lawyer, and you mean that uh, I instantiated lawyer at some time, um, then I'm safe. And usually what I'm trying to do when I'm doing these things is at least not say something wrong. Um, first, do no wrong. All right, so that brings us to hopefully some new stuff now. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go through a number of different ways that time can be added to OWL and RDF representations, uh, from the easiest reification, that's the pattern most people learn, uh, using information entities. That's a really practical thing to do in, in use cases. And then I think more interesting, uh, different kinds of temporalized relations. Um, phase-based relations, as I call them, where phase is a part of a, a life, and time-delimited relations. Um, so here's what reification works. Uh, maybe already people already know it. This is our sort of uh, zeroth order solution. You, know, you make a statement, and you say it's subject, predicate, or object, uh, and then you add statements to that statement, let it hold starting at a certain time. It ends at a certain time. Um, the representation I did in RDF is approximately the same in OWL. Um, the main disadvantage, and this will be the case generally, is that it's, in this case it's completely outside of OWL. There's absolutely nothing that your reasoner can, can do with these two things here, right? And maybe we can do better. Okay. Um, the second pattern is uh, when we have so, you know, BFO's theory of, um, uh, of qualities um, is that, uh, if you've read the paper, uh, The Weight of the Baby, is that you have one, let's say, one weight quality that you hold for your life, and then um, at different times the type changes, and that corresponds to the value uh, of your weight. Um, now, that's really hard to work with, right? Because we have to create new types for every single temperature. Uh, and uh, as I said, types aren't even in the domain of discourse for OWL. Uh, so this is very painful. So uh, one way that we get around is we say, well, we're making a, a measurement. We're going to have some information about that. Um, when you, if you measure 15 pounds, 15 pounds is effectively the name of, of, of a subtype of weight. You can have a, a reasonable interpretation of BFO um, as long as you understand what you're doing. And uh, it's often the case that we have to monitor uh, things like quality over time. And so we have this value specification pattern that was um, given uh, in an OB, right? So my weight is a quality, it adheres in me. Um, I've got this weight value specification instance, the information content entity. I point it at my weight. I say what its specified value is its unit and at what time. And I can have a series of these over time and this is a really, uh, for actually for some of my work, uh, the pattern to use. Um, it's not completely ontological and it's doing something which uh, I think in generally we try to avoid, which is to push problems that we have on the owls, on the sort of non-information side that we can't solve, uh, push them to the information side where there's a lot more, a lot fewer constraints. And it's, in some way, it's avoiding, it, it, it's avoiding the question, but uh, very practical. Uh, the reason it's a value specification rather than a, a measurement in general is that value specifications uh, like a certain temperature can be things like parts of plans. I need a 
make sure that the temperature of something is, is something else. And, and that's a different sort of thing. That's not a measurement. So value specification sort of carries the form um, and is non-committal as to sort of the reality of what it points to or what it's part of. Okay, phase-based relationships. So instead of relating a, a continuant to another continuant, relate a continuant to part of the history of another. And I'll have a picture to make this. So I, I, defined, I would define two new BFO terms, phase, which is defined as a temporal part of some history. It's a functional property. So that means there's a unique history that any phase is of, and a phase of relationship that relates that phase to the history. And you'll see that if we do things this way, we can make a property chain that lands up inferring a direct continuant continuant relationship. And then what we'll do is we'll specify the time, which is going to be outside, we'll relate it to um, the temporal extent of the phase. So here's the picture. Um, this is my life, supposedly. Um, this is a temporal part of my life called a phase. Um, I have a student role. I say that it inheres in during this phase. From this phase, I can go to the his history. And from the history, I can uniquely go to the person. So we get these property chains. Inheres in during, a phase of, a history of, gives us inheres in. Um, part of during, phase of, history of, gives us part of it sometime. Um, it doesn't let us say the specific times, but we can't say the specific times um, and reason about them, uh, uh, at least not in forms that look like this. But we can, we do have a temporal region, we have a relationship to a temporal interval, and we can talk about the start and end time. And I think that we're not doing any harm here. I think this is actually as, as kosher as it gets. So uh, what's good about this pattern? Um, it's sort of a uniform way of adding time for relations um, in an ontologically sound way. Um, the translation to first order logic is obvious. Uh, that means, why is that important? Uh, the translations, we want the translations to first order logic because we want to do things like do consistency checking. And we do consistency checking in the more powerful language, which is first order logic. So it's important that we, we know what we're doing when we're doing these translations. Um, the cons are, uh, oh sorry, there's one more thing about it. Um, uh, it, histories are only of material entities right now. So if we want to relate to a uh, quality, we can't do that because the quality doesn't have a history. So what's the uh, disadvantages? Well, uh, m yet more relations, but hopefully useful ones. Uh, and we can actually um, do something with transitivity as long as we move to something like uh, swirl or sparkle constructs. So we can do some reasoning outside of OWL, and I think that uh, this is a different kind of reasoning that, uh, outside OWL than the first order reason. And I think in general, uh, real systems are going to have to use uh, multiple, uh, multiple reasoners. We need a reasoner for concrete times, uh, like a time database uh, reasoner, uh, which first order logic just doesn't do anything about. Um, I've been trying to find examples of uh, 4D ontologies so I could figure out how they do the things they do. And I haven't come up with, with many. So afterwards, if somebody is a fan of 4D ontologies and can show me um, an actual worked example, that would be great. Um, I tempted to find one, uh, I guess there's one called Boro, uh, but the author said that it was only used in proprietary settings and he couldn't share it with me. So that was a bust. Uh, but I think this is the idea, right? You're relating to um, uh, sort of a, a history is kind of a spatial temporal worm. Um, it's better because it lands up, because of the property chains, it also lands us up in continuing space as well. Okay, um, this next set I call um, delimited time relationships. Uh, so the idea is that you're going to have a, a, to work with the two rule out of the, of the property. And if you can determine from that um, some 
fixed temporal interval, then you can assert that you're talking about that interval and you can gain transitivity, right? So you can, with this pattern, you can get um, uh, transitive and natural inverses. And all of these are going to be sub-properties of an at some time relation. So if you, even if you have multiple properties, you can still simplify your life by querying the top level at some times. So how am I, uh, let me just show you how I'm going to try to visualize uh, this in the figures. Um, the idea is that uh, when you see a line, it's available to be part of if there's another line on top of it. So this is a picture of a car, which eventually will have a tire replaced, and a tire which had an air cap replaced. And we're only going to get transitivity where all three things are there, right? So this is the range. And so we're going to look for a range to define a range for these other, other patterns. All right, the first one is kind of easy. Um, the DART mission, that was the one where they, they tried to divert a, an asteroid by smashing a spacecraft into it. Uh, really cool. Um, it ha it ha we know when, when that mission happened. We know when it started and when, when it ended. So we don't even need to know if we're saying part of, um, of parts on that spacecraft. We don't have to know anything about the part. We know the time. We just make that time the time argument. The translation is here. Here's our binary relation, and here's our Turner relation. Easy. Um, it's transitive because every single assertion of part of will have the same temporal index. Uh, we do have to have some domain knowledge that lets us say these things. Um, the domain knowledge in this case is that uh, while the spacecraft is flying, it's not gaining pieces or losing pieces. People aren't repairing it. Uh, that wouldn't work for Hubble, I guess. So here's our picture. Uh, you, know, at, at, you know, before the mission starts, um, we have various part relations. They can come and go. Uh, it's being built, right? The mission starts, and during this whole time, um, all of the things are um, available for partridge relations, and then the smash happens, and it's over. So part, we have that relation part of during DART, and we have a transitive relationship that works. Um, this, I think, is a happy situation, if, even if it's not uh, necessarily the most common one. Um, the second one is where uh, the time interval we have is related to a phase. So we, we have uh, parts of the body. And uh, if we can figure out what the um, phase of development is, we can, we can qualify those part relationships by the phase. This is an alternative to having a separate phase ontology. right? Um, uh, Fabian talked about you know, having a stage one ontology, stage two ontology, stage three ontology. In this case here, you have a single ontology with different relations part of during phase one, part of during phase two, part of during phase three. Um, we need to say a, a couple of things um, extra here uh, that are obvious to us, but they have to be axiomatized. Um, if two parts are in the same stage, they're part of the same person, and that a person's life has exactly one Carnegie stage phase for each of the Carnegie stages. So, We've gone from, this is, um, I won't detail this, uh, but this is a demonstration of sort of what an axiomatization of it looks like. It's missing a couple of axioms. Um, the idea here is I can take that definition and I can prove transitivity. So I can say it's transitive and you shouldn't believe me unless I can back it up with something. And the way to back it up is to prove that a relation defined that way uh, that these assumptions actually is transitive. And that's really one of the biggest utilities for me of the exercisation is that I can do that. Um, very similar to the, um, the Carnegie stage um, is what I call the, um, the uh, while operating. So part of while a machine is operating. So this is relevant for somebody, some people who are the industrial ontology economy, where you want to say that whenever the machine is constructing a hole and, and running, uh, these part relations hold. They might not hold um, uh, at other times. Uh, but we can make a transitive relation that works at least while they're operating. Uh, and again, we have to have some background knowledge. Um, the machine does, uses the same parts each time it's operating. Um, if you relate two parts, they're part of the same machine. 
uh, and the machine uh, participates in this process. And using those, I'm not going to give the axiom here, uh, but here's the illustration, right? So um, here we might be building a machine. Here it's operating. This should be gray and they're not showing up well. Here it's operating. Here it's stopped for repair. Here it's operating. Um, maybe there's a break. Nothing changed. And so on. So the way that we can make this um, and the problem with, with making uh, this one was that when I tried to prove it without using the method I use here, um, one of the part relations might be uh, in here and one of them might be in here and then they couldn't be transferred. So instead, uh, what I do is I make a sum process, uh, which is basically the sum of all operators. And it occupies this temporal interval. And this is why it's nice to have temporal intervals and te uh, sorry, temporal regions, so why it's nice to have temporal regions that aren't literals, because we can make these, these uh, we can make these sums. Um, it also, uh, if some people I've talked to about, about, about gappy existence, this sum process, the sum of these processes has gappy existence. It exists here, not here, exists here, not here, and exists here, right? So, um, you might want to question that ontologically. Uh, I don't know. Um, but at least we can do it. And I think BFO, we did, we, we allow this in BFO um, to Werner's dismay uh, because we didn't want to make the decision yet as to whether um, things only existed, for example, on, a, on an interval. So we left it open. And here's you know, the result of allowing us to do that. OK, so I will have time to talk about others. Um, so, uh, recap, right? Time matters. Um, it's hard, but not impossible to attend to time. Um, the axiomatization is useful because it can formalize these relationships. You can check them, and then once they're checked, you can have confidence in using them. Um, it, hopefully, I've given you an idea of how you can think about creating more of these relations. Um, there's still this outstanding uh, problem with how to interpret RDF type when translating to first order logic. I'm hoping that maybe we can have some, some discussions about what might work afterwards. So this is the end of my Time Matters presentation. And since I have a few minutes left, I'm going to move on to um, some other matters. Um, so I'm going to talk about three things um, that involve, that I consider um, BFO pain points. Um, roles for generically dependent continuance, um, process dependence and the idea of extending history to be applicable to all kinds of all entities, not just material entities. So, um, information entities have very similar uh, behavior um, uh, as independent continuance with roles. Uh, a social security number has a, I'm putting in quotes, role, this can't be a real role, uh, a role to be used in identification. We can think of it as manifesting in uh, the process of identification. Um, there's something about that GDC that allows it. Now, of course, it all happens to, the, to a particular concretization on a particular pair, but we ascribe that to the GDC as a whole, and mostly we care about the GDC as a whole, not any particular uh, usage of it. Um, data analysis, you might designate um, a particular data set as dependent or independent variable. Uh, and that's uh, realized in processes in certain ways of using the data. Um, information can be designated evidence. Um, it's manifested in process, in judicial processes. Um, and um, the attribution of a role to a GDC, like how the GDC gains it, is very similar um, to the birth of a certain social role, right? Social roles are often created by an act of speech, by or an act of, of thought. Um, and these role, these pseudo roles, by GDC roles, um, are similarly created, right? At the time we took the data, we designated one as independent and one as dependent. We dubbed them. So, um, how do I make this as BFO um, friendly um, and as Barry friendly as I can? So, one thing we'll do is. Um, we already have it that we, and we expanded this in, in BFO 2020, that 
uh, GECs and specifically dependents can participate in processes. Um, but uh, in, in BFO, what's really fundamental is that there's a material entity at the bottom that participates. Uh, these things don't participate on their own. So there's axioms that say that if a GDC um, participates, then some bearer of it participates. If an SDC participates, um, then Uh, then it's bare also. Um, so I think that's the way it would work for um, for, for uh, GDCs as well. A GDC realizing a role would imply that a carrier does. Um, I think the GDC roles themselves would be GDCs, um, and I think the concretizations would be roles. And that way, we know that the bare of the thing at the bottom uh, has the role to, to realize. Um, so here's my attempt at an elucidation. Uh, I tried to use the pattern of language Barry uses to minimize the criticism. So B is a GDC role means that B is a GDC, that GDC depends, that's a new relationship, on another GDC C, that some subset of bears C, some subset of bears of C bear role are correlated with B and which concretizes B and where realization of the GDC role, uh, GDC role uh, is a realization of the of the underlying bear. Uh, we have time, so if you have any comments about this definition now, I'm happy to entertain them. Uh, Fabian. So I don't understand the definition. You're not Fabian. I don't, we, we need more time, but there. I do have a point to make about your claims here. Okay. So you say um, that whether uh, a portion of data. You didn't say you didn't say portion of data. You I didn't nice. use the magic portion of words. No. So, so I'll say. I didn't say data set at one point. A portion of data can play either dependent variable or the independent variable role. Yes. And now, the very same portion of data might play a dependent variable role in room A and the independent variable role in room B. Sure, I may and be a so nurse and a lawyer. Hmm? Sure, I can be a nurse and a lawyer, and when I'm in a certain situation, I realize my nurse you, you can't role. have one at the same time be a lawyer and not a lawyer. Uh, right, I'm sorry, what is the problem that you're saying? So, one at the same time, the same portion of data is being used in the left-hand room. Oh, there's different, no, there's, 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 different, and there's different bearers in different rooms. Remember, the bearer is, is, is but then you so and, and all we land up saying I, think, I see what you're saying I think all we land up saying is that it's um, at the same time realizing the independent variable role and the variable role uh, and the dependent variable role yes, so the idea but those aren't kind of, the, the, yeah, I, don't so think I think you don't see the problem okay the idea of role is that there is a person who exists continuously and yep. for a certain time she plays the role of lawyer if we apply that to your dependent variable idea, we have a certain portion of data which exists continuously, and then for a certain portion of time, it's playing the role of being a dependent variable. Yes. That sounds very much like a lawyer, but the very same GDC may be both a dependent, have, it, have both a dependent variable role and the independent variable role at exactly the same time. Right. And that Why is doesn't that? Make sense from the lawyer, lawyer perspective. Let me let me give you a Fabian. example. Yeah. So uh, from the from a real world, uh, we are looking at uh, energy scenarios, right? So people create a scenario like uh, Germany in 2050 under the assumption that there is only renewable energy. Now these scenarios are compared, and there are and in studies, they are typically having several scenarios and comparing. In these studies, typically, one is this of the scenarios called the reference scenario. That's basically baseline, the other things are compared with explain identically with a particular rule in yep. this study. The same scenario can be the uh, reference scenario in one study and the non reference scenario in another study. So, this is very similar. To the, uh, to it, it sounds to me like a, a, a case of one process realizing two roles, which can certainly happen, right? 
Yep. And at the same time, Barry, you give the example of um, you're standing beside your wife or something, and you say something to, to your mistress yeah. that you know works for the mistress and works for the wife, right? Mm -hmm. So you're realizing two roles at the same time. It's not a con it's not a it's not unheard of, right? So the GDC could realize two roles. What's that? Speaking the microphone. Oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah. Um, right. So if we can realize uh, two roles at once, um, I don't see how that's different in the GDC case. We're realizing two roles at, at once. Okay. Maybe move on. If there's anybody else have a thought or comment? All right, that's proposal number one. There's one of the back. Yeah, sorry. Oh, there is. Sure. Uh, yes. Um, I guess I, I, the first question I would ask is if you have trouble imagining a GDC altogether. Um, if we have we have these entities called GDCs and they're not inert, right? They're something. They act in the world in some way. And so um, this is a way they act in the world. Otherwise, you know, we certainly say they can participate. It's not clear to me why we can't say they realize. And what it means at, at the ground level is that there's some error with some rule that's correlated that realizes it. And we transfer it up to the GDC because, in general, we don't care about the particular error. We don't even know the particular error. So if we're going to make any kind of generalization, we have to make a generalization at the GDC point. It's the only place to do it. Um, with it. So we could say, OK, well, um, no, you can't do that. And then we lose a whole um, sort of important aspect of information, which is that it's used for certain things. Sometimes it's actually created for certain purposes. Um, I don't know any other way of expressing that now. And that seems to be a big gap. It sounds like you suggested that I understand the basic PC. It's, it's directly an analogous to the way we say an SDC participates, and then we have an axiom that says if an SDC participates, then it's bare participates as well. And it's a little different for GDCs because GDCs have many bearers, and so we say some bearer of it participates in a certain way. Um, is that a human? You no, know, I mean, I mean, GDCs, we have a class of GDCs because it happens with regularity in the world, right? Um, so it's not a euphemism for, for, for anything. Uh, I guess the question is what sort of things are we allowed to say uh, about GDCs? And it seems like the answer is very little. And uh, if we can't say much about GDCs, then uh, as nice as it is to have them in an ontology, um, they're not very interesting. Uh, so uh, this phenomena, which is that there's a point in time where there's some ascription to the GDC that can be used that's only manifested later in a process, that's exactly what a role, how a role behaves. Now, I didn't call it a role because the role's already taken, but that pattern, right, it's going to be used as an independent variable now. It's then used, right? It has it. It doesn't have to be realized, right? All the things we say about roles um, seem to be able to be said about GDCs as well. Yeah. Was there another one? Yes. Uh, thank you. I hardly agree with the idea of GDC role because I have an example. So, for example, a portion of money is a GDC, but we can use money to do many things. For example, if I pay five hundred dollars to rent a house. In that case, we can say uh, the portion of money uh, have a GDC role that is a uh, uh, rental fee. So that is uh, one. Right. I think the role would match better if you know you sort of have a bank account, which is the money you're setting aside to buy the house, and then that money would have a role, and that role would be realized when you buy the house. That's how how I would say. 
So okay, so the, the biggest criticism right now is the idea that more than one role can be realized in two different rooms. So how can anyone think about that? Yeah. Uh, Forrest, sorry. Ellen, I'm also not Debbie. Can I just talk to Pardon I'm me? also not Fabian. Can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Everybody else seems to. Uh, uh, very, I'm, I'm, and I'm just, this is actually a question of Barry, because I don't quite understand the, the point that you're making. Are, are, were you saying that a person cannot be a lawyer and be a non-lawyer at the same time? A person cannot have the lawyer role okay. and the non-lawyer role at the same time. So, how is your definition of not lawyer? Because I would imagine that a person could be playing, you know, table hockey with his son at the same yeah, time. Yeah, right. seems to be a lawyer. So, wouldn't that be playing table hockey be uh, um, a non-lawyer role? So, there's no logical contradiction between being a lawyer and playing table hockey. There is a logical contradiction between being a lawyer and being a non-lawyer, or, or not being a lawyer. Okay, so so not being a lawyer is what you're saying. So, so that okay, so if that's the case, I don't quite understand how that that example applies to this. Just because you're an independent variable in one process at the same time, and you're a dependent variable in another process at a certain time, how is that not being? It's not a contradiction, basically. It's not. It's not a. It's not a negation. It sounds. It sounds like a contradiction if you say x is a dependent variable and an independent variable at t. That sounds like a contradiction. Well, well first of all, we don't we don't say at t, right? Is that right? <laughs> no, the roles are not don't are temporally indexed. You have a role, and if you have the role as long as it exists, so we don't temporally index the inheritance. No, but we can assert when the role begins to exist and when it ceases. Yes. Okay, then let's just take the beginning. At t, John, sorry, at t, this portion of data acquired simultaneously the role of dependent variable and the role of independent variable. Right, that sounds like it's not I, I don't think it is. I don't, I don't think it I actually think, is. This is why I gave you my example. That something being a reference scenario in one study and not being a reference scenario in another study is perfectly Okay, right. yeah. so I think so. It has so. a role of reference scenarios, it has a role of whatever non reference scenarios. And it's because the roles are dependent on uh, involving different studies. And that's perfectly normal. Yeah. It actually happens. I mean, it's not a theoretical example. They're different uses of the same GDC. GDCs are funny because you can have it being used at two places at once, right? Because it exists in many places at once. I mean, if, if we can logically, forget about ontologies, if we can logically take a set of data, a portion of data, or data set, and use it in one study as a dependent variable, that doesn't mean that in another paper also published at the same time is using it as, let's say, as an independent variable. It, there's nothing illogical about being able to use it in both cases, right? There's not a negation by doing so, I don't think. This part, um, some subset of bearers speaks a little bit to, to what you're saying, um, but not completely. I do understand. Okay. Um, are there any more comments? Am I missing anybody? No. I'm, I'm trying to get well, I'm not sure if it'll work, but I was thinking of like a, a pattern of code that is embedded as clean code within a certain software, piece of software, and yet embedded or described or described as uh, malware or it's uh, potentially malicious in another. Um, nope, that wasn't me. And then with the assertion that the, the clean code is not malicious code, so that you cannot have those two overlapping, that would be a contradiction, right? Um, let me think. Well, uh, malicious code often has clean codes as parts, right. at least. Yeah. So it's a little bit closer. Um, and whether, um, remember, clean designation does not mean actually clean, right? That's an sure. assessment. And so that doesn't mean it also can't be malware if the assessment is, is wrong. Right. Um, I think that's the classic example of this is a, this is a pencil that I use to stab you. Um, it's, not, it's a writing instrument. Its role, its function was writing instrument or using a weapon role, right? 
are the classic example of why ontologies keep arguing about things. I don't think it gets. I think you need a negation. It's just that I don't think we have a lot of cases of negation. We usually have roles that are sort of positive and non-interacting. If we looked at sort of the set of roles, um, and, and, and that's because the role can exist and, noth and, and, and nothing is happening at a time. So there's nothing to sort of contradict. It only matters, so to speak, when it manifests, and it only manifests in the process. I guess the question is, if you can find a negation, does that mean that this, that this particular convention would necessarily be a bad one, or is it just admitting that there could be a negation, just like a person shouldn't be a, a lawyer and a not? I, I will say this: um, uh, the challenge, Barry, is for you, to, you know, for us to axiomatize this, and then for you to give me a set of formulas that is contradictory re but reasonable. Um, this sort of conversation, is it right or is it wrong, is sort of a classic example of uh, where we come to an impasse in discussing BFO. It's really hard to sort these things out without some formal system. So that's my challenge. My ch I'll challenge myself to write this up and, and, and add it to the model, and I'll challenge you to write some model that um, shouldn't be the case. And then we can, we can go on. Um, I'm at one hour, but I think I have a few more minutes, so I will do the second one. Um, the second one is process dependence. Uh, I think Barry's coming around on this. Um, we have very limited expressivity when it comes to processes. We've got parts, participants, and realizations, and that's it. And when we try to construct processes and give them more rich definitions, we land up forcing this, uh, the, the thing into one pattern. The example is process profile, where uh, we add a process, and the only information in it is its name. All, you know, there's no axiomatization of it. So I think that's a problem. Alec, yeah. Question. Yeah. What happens with the lawyer who's disbarred in one state but he's not disbarred in another state? Do you um, have to apply temporal and spatial relationships? It's probably that there are two different lawyer roles. One a state a state specific lawyer role. It sounds like. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So can I say something about process profile just to make sure we're on the same page? Sure. The classic example of a process profile is that which a temperature chart represents. That is to say, it's the changes in the temperature quality of a given individual over a specific time. It's a process, of course, but it's a thin process. Yeah, I so think this idea of... Uh, all the other parts of the temperature change process, which are not recorded on the chart. So I alluded to this being a problem when I said that we don't have a, um, a theory of what it means to be part of a process. All of the axioms we have about processes insist that they have a spatial, spatial temporal extent. This kind of process doesn't. Now, that means you know, it, it, the axiomatization has to be changed in some way, and ideally it's changed in a way that sanctions different kinds of parts. Okay, it has its temporal extent because the chart tells you when it can be. Yes, almost, now, it's almost this, pregnant. This is a, I, I, I don't like doing philosophy, but I'm afraid here I have to do some philosophy. Uh, there are some processes which are only loosely tied to space. And an example would be your thinking now about the capital of Finland. Yep. That's not really in any specific point in your brain, nor is it in any spatial region including Finland. But well, it's, it's, va it's basically in my brain. It's just vague as to where exactly it is. Okay, that's, that's, a vague, that's a vagueness issue. But, th but these process profiles don't, aren't even vague. They have no, they have no, we have no idea of where they are. Process profile. We can't know where they are because they aren't spatial temporally located. Is as clearly located in you as is any thought in your brain. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see it that way. Well, but where is your temperature? Uh, uh, I, where is my role? I don't know. We, no. we, formally, we don't have spatial temporal regions for dependent continuance, so I don't have to ask that well, question. We're talking about processes. Right. Um, so processes like temperature and like consciousness and so on are often, as you would say, vaguely tied to space. That's fine. They're still in space. I mean, they're not in Finland. They're in. 
Uh, I, I'd have to look at, uh, have to look at them, but I, I don't think that holds for all of them. Um, okay, so nice. But but it would be nice to have. I guess the bottom line it would be nice to have um, a better um, theory of um, parthood of processes. We have this other argument where we have you know, the example of a ball spinning and heating up, yeah. and the question is, is there one or two processes? And to me, there's one process. It's basically a segment of the history of the ball. And to me, there is and one to, and two, because I embrace the cheese pairing principle, which says that you can cut the cheese, the very same cheese, in different ways. Sometimes you get two bits, sometimes you get ten bits. It's always the same cheese. You can cut the process which is the spinning top, which is simultaneously increasing in temperature, either into one process, which is spinning and increasing in temperature, or into two processes, which are spinning on the one hand and increasing temperature. In the other. Um, I, I think that would be actually um, inconsistent because, in, uh, because the, uh, well, it will be inconsistent. Uh, because the process, I think, is the his I guess if you're taking parts of history that way, um, I think I'm going to leave it at. I would like to have a clear idea of what ways we can cut I processes, my clear idea. I, and I don't want it to be in words. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, I have some examples, and then I'm going to stop. Um, these were just quick ones that I, tr I tried to pull up duration. Um, coordination, like you know how coordinated two dancers are, um, cyclicity, frequency at which a process has a given a process of given type, there's accident rate, or fraction of time a clinical feature is present, social ascriptions, uh, unlawful process, unplanned process, successful process. Um, summarization, um, it was a relaxing process. Um, the thing that's in common of these is that they only make sense across extended periods of time, not moment to moment. Um, I think a lot of these are atomic. They don't have proper temporal parts. That's okay. We have temporal instances that don't have proper temporal parts either. And then for continuum process dependence, I think a lot of the ones that we've talked about in the past as potential qualities, speed, acceleration, um, the idea is that speed and acceleration depends on the entity and the fact that they're in a certain motion process. Um, level of exertion, that's something that's continuous. It's like your heartbeat. Increasing or decreasing temperature. Uh, each of these things can be A, talked about at a specific moment, um, and B, attached to a bear or, or several bears. And that is going to be, oh yes, I tried to write it out. Right, you can criticize these, these elucidations. B is a continuant dependent continuant, means B is, specifically de B is a specifically dependent continuant, and B process depends on some process. It's an occurrence dependent continuant if it's an occurrence, and a process depends on some process. And process depends on is, um, is a relationship between uh, where uh, the latter would not exist unless the former does. Isn't it, doesn't that make it circular because you're using the line, uh, de definition three in definitions one and two and you're using definitions well, one and two? Oh, this follows exactly the same pattern you'll see in the BFO definitions. In fact, it's mostly cribbed from the BFO de de definitions with, with words change. I don't think circular uh, is a circular is in, you know one definition using itself inside of it. Uh, circular in the sense that they're interdependent definitions. I don't think um, is 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 a, is a problem. And I, I'm pretty sure that if we looked at the BFI definitions, we'd find that. It's often unavoidable at very basic uh, level. And this is pretty basic. And so I think it's unavoidable. Um, I'm going to stop. I have another one, but uh, that's it. So thank you very much for listening. Um, we might have...